Welcome to lecture 16. I am obviously not on campus. Carnegie Mellon shut down all in-class lectures and I can't even go into classrooms anymore. The campus is shut down. I can't even go in there to my office. Um, so I'm here at home recording this in, in my own office. Uh, it's just me and then I have the, the terrier over here sitting at, in the audience uh, that's watching this the entire time. So just, you know, the two of us are gonna get through this together, okay? So today's lecture is now gonna be a follow-up on uh, where we left off before the spring break discussing uh, the two different main methods to sp speed up query performance. Uh, and that was the vectorization and compilation. So in both cases, we saw that you can get better query performance, execution performance in either of these approaches, but we mostly looked at them in isolation of each other. And so now today's lecture or today's paper you guys were assigned to read is about now to understand the, 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 in what circumstances would one approach be better than another. Um, and the reason why we want to we discuss this, uh, the, the two of these things together is the, the, these are major architectural decisions you have to make about the design of a database system, you know, whether you're going the compilation route or the vectorization route. Uh, and so it's important for us to understand what are the trade-offs for each of them so that, you know, if, if we're building a brand new system, we, we can make this, this decision early on because it'd be very difficult to go back and retrofit an existing database system to either introduce, you know, these, these different concepts. I, I will say unscientifically, I think adding in vectorization uh, to an existing system would be easier to do than compilation. Um, but either, either way, that both of them are, are you know, pretty, pretty significant changes. So the, today's lecture is, the, today's paper uh, was sort of comparing this, the vector-wise approach versus the hyper approach. Now, the, they sort of claim that, it's, that the two are mutually exclusive, and we'll sort of see something at the end that we've done here at CMU that shows that you can actually blend the two together. Um, but for, at least for initially, let's, let's assume that it's, it's either one or the other. So let's go back now and um, let's sort of have to do a quick refresher of what vector-wise looks like, or you know, vector-wise execution model looks like, and what does the compilation uh, execution model look like in Hyper. So again, the the vector-wise approach was that they were going to have all these primitives written in the database system that would do uh, a small portion of a of a, you know, the execution of of a query. So primitive might be like evaluating a predicate with the inequality less than, greater than, right? You have separate primitives for all of these. For, and then you have one for each, each type your, your database system supported. So the idea is that the database developers would write all these primitives and then they get compiled into the binary, the database system binary that's shipped to any customers or users. And then at runtime, when a query shows up, the way they're going to execute the query plan is that they're essentially going to stitch together all these primitives in a plan that overall that's, that's interpreted that's going to allow them to invoke these primitives at the right time in order to execute the query and produce the correct result. So now you'd be thinking, well, these primitives are just all function calls. Isn't this going to get expensive? Well, yes, because again, that's like a jump uh, in, your, in your execution code and, uh, you know, that, that's that can be expensive for, for modern superscalar CPUs, but the way they're going to avoid having these function calls slow them, slow them down is that they're going to amortize their cost because for each function call to a primitive, they're going to be passing in a vector of values that they can then process uh, in batches. So you, you, you wouldn't be doing this for every single tuple, you know, invoking a primitive. So the output of all the primitives are just going to be now offsets of the tuples that matched uh, or whatever the, or that satisfy whatever the, the primitive was actually trying to do. So let's look at a high level example like this. Say that we have a select statement, select star from foo, on a string column equals ABC and an integer column equals four. So the query plan for this is super simple, right? It's just the sequential scan on the table. And then I have my predicate operator, or my filter operator that's gonna apply uh, the, the conjunction clauses of these two. 
So the way vector wise would work is that for each of these predicates I want to evaluate, they would be a separate primitive based on the, the column type. So in this first one here, it's a string column. So I would have a separate primitive that would be able to process a, uh, on a, on a vector of, of strings from, from, my, from the column I'm scanning, passing in the value that I'm looking for. And then now I can uh, just do a, a for loop over that column and check to see whether my, 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 my value I'm passing in matches. And if so, then I, then I append the offset of the tuple that match in my output vector. Right, and, and then I'm calling this the output vector of, of offsets, right? That's a sort of synthetic thing, just you know, usually just integers, but here's just a way to indicate that it's an offset, not a regular in integer. So then now for the second predicate, I have another uh, primitive, but in this case here, instead of actually taking in just the column and the value that I'm looking for, we also have to be provided a vector of the offset positions that satisfied my first predicate. So then now in my for loop, I'm scanning over those positions rather than just the, the opposite of the columns. So what, what's that? What's that? Okay. All right, so uh, the Terry asked the question, um, do I have to size these vectors ahead of time? Because like in this case here, I don't know how many, how many, uh, how many two boards are gonna, are, gonna, are gonna match in my offset vector. You know, should that be a fixed size or should it be a variable length size? Again, we are doing this on batches of tuples, so you could just allocate this to this just to be the size of the, the the max size of the output, and then you can just record you know where you left off. I'm sort of this is a simplified view, so I'm not really showing that. It's a good question, Terrier. Thank you. All right, so the hyper approach again the is to compile queries. So instead of having these pre-compiled uh, primitives. You're going to generate on the fly at runtime for every query the code that you would then need to compile for that particular query plan. So no longer do you have to do any interpretation to know like, yeah, I'm accessing this column and this column's this type and therefore I need to evoke this primitive. You're just baking into directly into the query plan exactly what it should be doing based on what you know the schema of the table is from, from the catalog. So it's the hyper approach is sort of more than this compilation and this paper sort of get, gets into that. Right, they're doing this bottom-up or push-based model where the at the bottom of every single pipeline, they're going to be they're, you're going to scan over the input uh, the input table or whatever the 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 output the, the pipeline below you. You're scanning over the tuples one by one, and then what happens is instead of scanning one tuple and doing one operation and then going to the next tuple in for that pipeline. You're actually going to ride that tuple up the pipeline all the way as far as you can until you get to the top with the pipeline breaker, and then you loop back or down and go get the next tuple. And the idea here, because we're pushing that tuple all the way up, we can maximize uh, the the cache locality. In some cases, we're able to actually guarantee that the tuple will, will reside in the CPU registers, which are faster than in CPU caches, and that's how uh, that's how they're going to get better performance. So the as written or as described in the 2011 paper with, with Hyper and with the newer version Umbra that, that the, the Germans have been building, the, the, uh, the, this compilation model is, is, is not assuming that you're doing any vectorization, right? It's that push-based model is getting grabbing one tuple, riding it up the pipeline. But we'll see at the uh, end of this lecture, we'll see a technique we've, not, we've developed that can, can sort of can combine both of them. So this is just an example of what the, that, that, that query would look like in Hyper just to do the scam. Again, so now instead of having two separate functions for each predicate, I'm just gonna have sort of one function that I would cogen that would take in the string column, take in the integer column, and the two constant values I'm trying to compare against them uh, with. And then as now I just iterate over one tuple at a time. And then I do all the predicate evaluation for that one tuple before I go, go on to the, to the next one. All right? Okay. so. Again, the, the the paper that you guys are assigned to read is sort of an, trying to answer this question of, is it better to stitch together those pre-compiled primitives as in vector-wise, or should we do the holistic compilation like in Hyper uh, and with that, that push-based processing model? So again, the first part of the lecture is trying to understand these two distinct uh, design approaches. Um, and then the second part will be finishing up with how the a way for sort of blending them together into a, a hybrid query processing model. Okay. 
All right, so the paper you guys designed to read uh, was about evaluating these two different approaches. And the way they went ahead, the way, the way they did this was that they built a single test bed system that would allow us to do a, like a true apples to apples comparison of the two approaches without having the results encumbered or affected by other features or other implementation aspects of the database systems. So what I mean by that is the, this, they're gonna implement all the algorithms for the queries that we're gonna evaluate exactly the same at a high level for the two different approaches in, this, in sort of the single test system. And then we don't worry about other things like how are they, gonna, how are they doing thread scheduling, how are they representing integers or numerics or, or, or floating point numbers, uh, how they're actually gonna do any comparison to strings. All those things like that are the same across all systems and so that way we can just sort of focus on exactly what the, how the two different approaches are gonna perform. So again, all the high level algorithms are the same, but then the, there'll be some variations in the implementation details that are specific to each system for these algorithms. So again, the threading approach is gonna be the same, how they represent numbers are gonna be the same, but certain aspects of the operator implementations that we're evaluating will be slightly different. So in the case of the hash join is a, is a good example. The high level hash join algorithm is gonna be exactly the same. Right? You're gonna build a hash table and then probe it. And they're gonna use linear probing hashing for both of them. But the systems are gonna end up using different hash, hash functions for these hash table because uh, there's certain characteristics of those hash functions that are more are amenable or better, uh, make better utilization of the two different architectures. So in the case of VectorWise, they're gonna use Murmur2 because this is gonna execute as twice as many instructions as uh, CRC32, but they're gonna get better throughput, which is better for a vectorized architecture. In the case of Hyper, since they wanna have, uh, since they're looking at a single tuple at a time, when they do a hash and they hash it and they put it into the, the hash table or do the probe, they want a really, really fast hash function that can operate on one tuple at a time. So that, that's what CRC is gonna do, right? Because it'll execute 40% fewer instructions than Murmur2. Um, and this is gonna be better for uh, the, again, the, these sort of simple loops that, that Hyper is gonna, gonna try to support, right? Okay. So, uh, the two systems we're gonna implement are, are variations or they are simplified versions of VectorWise and Hyper. Um, so the first one can be called TectorWise, the second one's called Typer. What's that? All right, so the, the Terry's question is, why is, there, why, is it, why is it called TectorWise or Typer with a T instead of VectorWise or Hyper with the original names? So the, the, the name of the first author was Timo, so he just put the T in, in front of both of these names. Uh, thank you, Terry. Okay. So the, in the case of VectorWise, again, what they're gonna do is gonna break up all the operations we can have when we execute queries into these pre-compiled primitives. And then they're gonna stitch together the uh, query plan in this sort of interpreted model where I, I know what function, I, a primitive I need to invoke in order to execute the query based on the type of, uh, the, type of the column that I'm processing. So they're also gonna need to materialize the output of all the primitives at each step. So like if I invoke that primitive and then I, it generates me a, a vector of offsets, I have to write that somewhere. And then I have to then feed that as input into my other primitives that take in uh, previously matching offsets. In the case of Typer or Hyper, all right, they're gonna do the LLVM JIT compilation, the push-based query process model, where you're gonna take a single tuple and write it up as far as you can in the pipeline as far as possible, right? Um, and for each sort of step within the pipeline, you don't need to materialize results in a separate buffer, right? You just take the output immediately of the of whatever step you're doing, and then that's used as the input to the next one without having to do a mem copy. So for this one, they're gonna evaluate uh, five queries in TPCH. TPCH is a widely used analytical workload. Um, and they pick these five queries because They've, they've selected them based on having a, uh, that they would cover each, the, sort of the different aspects of the query would cover enough about the 
that uh, will be, be emblematic of what real work real workloads look like. So this is a great paper written by Thomas Neumann and Peter Bonds, the vector bias and hyper guy, where they evaluated the different type of uh, TPH queries, compare them against what real workloads look like, and they sort of come up with sort of five categories of like, hey, here's the here's standard things or, or, or common patterns we see in in queries, and here's ones in, in TPCH that. Um, that sort of cover each category. So these aren't just picked at random, these are selected for, uh, for a very specific reason. So Q1 will be a really simple one, it's just a, a scan with a fixed point arithmetic and, and then doing a five group aggregation, a group by. Six will be, query six will be just a scan with some, some filters. Q3 and Q9 are gonna be doing joins, uh, but they're gonna vary in the, the, the build side of the join, right? And the ratio between the probe and the build. Right, in this case here, the Q3, the, the build side is much smaller than the probe side, and this one here, although it's still smaller, it's not, the difference is, is not as significant between, as in Q3. And finally, in Q, Q18, we're doing a high, cardin high cardinality aggregation, which means an aggregation where there's a lot of uh, unique keys that are in the hash table for the group by clause. So it's gonna have 1.5 million groups, which is uh, pr pretty massive. All right, so the, the first graph we're going to look at is just the raw performance difference between the, the, two, the, the different approaches. So the first thing to point out is for Q1 and Q18, Hyper is actually doing the best, right? Hyper is actually outperforming uh, vector-wise. But for uh, Q6, Q3, and Q9, the, the predicate scan, the, the selective filtering, and then the two joins, vector-wise is actually doing better. So these graphs are interesting, right? They sort of tell us which one is better, but they don't really explain why, right? And so to understand why these are doing better, to understand what these different models are, are actually doing as they execute these queries, we need to look at the low level performance counters that the hardware is gonna provide us for, uh, you know, dur during query execution. So for this table here, right, this is running this with uh, collecting the, the, you know, the hardware performance counters from, from Linux, so you have cycles, instructions uh, per cycle, total number of instructions, sorry, cycles, inst instructions per cycle, instructions, L1 uh, catch misses, last level catch misses, and branch misses. And then the little star here just indicates for the, from which of these two systems from the previous graph actually had the, the, the best performance. So this is gonna be running again at the TPCH queries on a scale factor of one. So it's a, um, it's a database with, with uh, one gigabyte uh, with total data. Um, and then for all of these, these results here are gonna be normalized based on the number of tuples that were processed per query. So in the case of like this one up here, uh, Hyper does 34 cycles. So this means that for every tuple that the database, the database system had to process in order to answer the, execute this query, each tuple took 34 cycles to actually complete, do, do whatever processing it needed to do. So the third thing to point out here though, is that we see in the case of Q1 and Q18 where Hyper was actually performing the best, the, we see a clear indication that these two systems, uh, that they're executing different, a different number of instructions per, per tuple. So in the case of Q1, right, this is executing 162 instructions per, per tuple, this is 68, 46 to 102. So this is sort of explaining why Hyper is actually performed better. Well, it's because it's just ex executing simply fewer number of instructions than, than, uh, than, than ve vector-wise, right? And this is to be expected because these queries are computationally more heavy than the other queries. So the Hyper is getting better performance for the, the, the fixed point arithmetic and the uh, it has a higher utilization of in-cache aggregation. So therefore, because you know, it doesn't have to materialize any, any of the values as it's going along, where VectorWise does, it ends up executing uh, much fewer instructions. So, and you see this also, too, this is also interesting to point out too, is that the instruction count is lower, but the instructions per cycle is actually worse for a hyper. So instructions per cycle, the higher the better. It means for every cycle, I can execute more things. So in the case of Hyper, it's executing uh, two instructions per cycle, whereas Vectorwise is doing 2.8. So you would think 
again, that vector-wise would be better here because it's doing more work for every single cycle. But the difference is that it's just executing way more instructions to actually process the query. So that that's why it's, it's you know it's getting you know, that's why it loses to hyper. All right. So the next one we want to look at are the two joins Q3 and Q9. So again, if we look at the uh, instructions per cycle and the number of instructions in total, just like in Q1 and Q18, hyper is uh, executing fewer instructions and is doing fewer instructions per cycle. But we saw that VectorWise was actually doing the best here. So this is showing you now that you just can't look at instructions per cycle or instruction count uh, to understand why performance is bad, right? In this case here, if we just assume that, oh, if the number of instructions is less, as we saw with, uh, with Hyper and Q1, it's less here, therefore it should be faster. It's actually not, right? VectorWise is doing faster here. So there's something else we need to look at now to explain why we're seeing this, this performance uh, difference. So if we go now and look at the branch misprediction uh, from the CPU, we see that the, the number, the difference between these two queries or two systems is actually quite significant, right? So you would think, all right, this is now explaining why there's such a difference in performance for, between, for, for doing these joins. But this also now doesn't, uh, this, you know, this same, um, the, the same observation cannot be then applied for the other join, Q9, because now if we go look at its, you know, its prediction, it's actually, uh, they're about, about the same. And the, the difference in instructions per cycle and the, and the total number of instructions is about the same for Q3. So there's something else going on about this query that's causing it to, um, to, to, to do better uh, on vector-wise. So the difference now, though, is that just the total number of cycles per tuple is much higher than the other ones. And so what's going on here? Well, vector-wise is going to have, uh, uh, when, when you're doing the hash probe on the, for the join, because there's way more tuples in this one in Q9 than Q3, those, all those probes are always going to be cache dolls because, or cache, you know, yeah, cache dolls, or ca yeah, cache misses because you're going out to a random location that may not be in your CPU cache if your hash table is really large, and therefore you have a stall from the CPU because you're going to have to go fetch things from, from memory. And there's not really any way to have speculative execution speed that up because you know, you're trying to execute this tuple in, in, in Hyper, there's nothing really else to, to speculative execute. Like I can't proceed until I go get the, that next memory location to put it for the hash table to put the tuple out that I, I'm trying to, trying to probe or trying to insert. Right. So in the case of uh, hyper, the probe loop is way more complex than it is in vector-wise, even though it's using a more more efficient hash function. But for this reason, uh, the way that's sort of set up with these vectorized, uh, you know, processing these, these vectors of data, it's able to sort of amortize those memory stalls uh, across across you know every every single vector. So again, the main takeaway from, from this table is just saying that there isn't one approach or there isn't one metric we could look at to explain why one database system is going to perform better than another in these, for these different queries. We have to sort of take it on a case-by-case -case basis to understand what's going on. So the main findings, again, is, as I said, uh, both of these models are actually going to be actually quite efficient. And the, the difference to explain their the performance <clears throat> discrepancies where one might be better than another can vary from one query to the next. So I, I should also point out too, going back here, the, the difference in performance for these, these different engines is actually quite small. Like in this case here, this is probably the largest gap. This is what, so say Hyper is doing 50 milliseconds for Q1 and VectorWise is doing a little over 80 milliseconds. So we're really only talking about a 30 millisecond difference. In this case here, it's, 150 mil, it's a 50 millisecond difference. In the grand scale of things compared to existing or traditional database systems, this is a drop in the bucket. As the paper mentions, the performance difference you're gonna have between you know, either of these approaches for in-memory databases is gonna be two orders of magnitude faster than traditional database system approaches like with Postgres using the Volcano model, things like that. So we're really starting to like split hairs here, but 
the you know the difference so the difference between these two systems in absolute numbers is not that great although in the relative numbers could be actually quite significant but the main takeaway is that maybe it actually it doesn't matter that much again at, at, when you start start counting cycles uh it you know, it's, things things don't don't matter that much um to give an example also too my PhD student prashant uh after he finished the rough ROF paper, which I'll talk about next, he then spent maybe like a half a year trying to make hash joins go faster for in-memory databases. And it got to the point where we were like saying, oh, well, the state of the art can do 12 cycles per tuple and we can do 11 cycles per tuple. And at that point, you don't really see uh, that significant of a difference. So the other two main takeaways from this as well is that the uh, the data-centric approach from, like in Hyper, was better for the calculation-heavy uh, queries where you had fewer cache misses because I can just sort of have these tight loops to process the same two boards in my register over and over again, and that was really fast. And the vectorization model was a bit better for hiding the, the cache, mis mis cache misses problems uh, when you're doing the hash join, uh, the, the bill side or the probe side. Okay? All right, so now, the... Next thing we want to talk about is uh, how much is SIMD actually helping us uh, in, the, in the case of vector-wise. Right? They make a big deal about, oh, because we're, we're, we're doing uh, vectorized primitives or we're processing columns of data. Therefore, we should be able to take advantage of SIMD to get better performance uh, and, and, and use more efficient instructions to execute, uh, you know, execute our primitives. So now we want to understand what was, you know, what is actually the benefit we're getting from using using SIMD. So for this, they're going to be doing all the algorithms using AVX 512, so 512-bit registers. And contrast this with the Columbia paper we read that was using everything as 256-bit uh, registers, AVX 2, because AVX 2 came out or AVX 512 came out in 2017. We did this paper in 2018 or 2017, 2018, and the Columbia paper was in 2016. So it's, the Columbia paper didn't have AVX 512 at that time. Um, the other thing to point out too is that because now we have 512, in addition to having larger registers, Intel added some additional instructions that are gonna make it easier for us to do more vertical ver vectorization in, uh, in our implementations of, of our operators, or of our primitives. So we're going a little bit farther beyond than what the Columbia guys were actually able to, able to do as well. So there's really only two graphs to look at. The first is breaking down the uh, performance benefit you're gonna get for, for a vectorized or SIMD primitive compared to the scalar one. So this is taking the primitives to do hashing, gather, and the join. And we have one implementation that's the scalar, uh, the scalar code, and then one that's doing explicit uh, vectorization with SIMD using intrinsics. And for this, we're gonna run a, uh, just gonna run a one gigabyte database. Um, and process these tuples, these two approaches in a single thread, and then see what the difference is, is in performance. And so, just like in the Columbia paper, you can actually get a quite a bit of significant improvement in performance when you use SIMD. So in the case of the hashing uh, primitive, you get a 2.3x improvement. That, that, that's actually a lot over the scalar version. For the gather, not so much, but for the join case, you get 1.4x. Again, that's roughly about what the Columbia paper was talking about. And that's actually quite, you know, that, that's a pretty good number for just changing this one primitive that you're using all the time. The problem is going to be, though, is now once you put this into a full system and the data you're processing uh, no longer fits in your CPU caches, just like, in the, again, we said in the Columbia paper, then all this sort of starts to fall apart. So this graph here is showing the performance of executing Q3 and Q9 the full, again, the full uh, query plan now uh, with invoking all the different primitives. And now you see if you incorporate the vectorized primitives that we've shown here, you're not getting this up to, you know, over 2x performance improvement. You're getting at most 1.1x. Because again, once things no longer fit in the CPU caches, once you have to, you have to incorporate the overhead of materializing the output, copying it from one buffer to the next or one CMD register to the next and over and over again, that all that sort of uh, coordination to use SIMD and execute the query becomes the main bottleneck and you don't get that great performance benefit you get from just looking at the SIMD primitives by themselves, all right? So again, the main takeaway here is that 
yes, SIMD is going to help, certainly when you look at the primitives by themselves, but when you look at the, the holistically the entire query, it's not as significant. All right, so the last thing we're gonna look at now is in, for this paper, is how well can the compiler support auto vectorization? So remember when we talked about before, when we talked about uh, uh, vectorization, we said there was three ways to get it, right? You could uh, do explicit vectorization and we're using intrinsics in your code. You could do compiler hints, like the pragmas, the preprocessor directors that say, hey, for this function, you know, don't worry about the memory overlapping. You can go ahead and vectorize everything. Or you can rely on the compiler to try to figure out that a certain function or primitive in the case of vectorwise could be vectorized and it, hope that it does it for you. So we evaluated three different uh, compilers, GCC, Clang, and ICC. Turns out that the ICC from Intel, the Intel C++ compiler, turns out it was actually the best at auto vectorizing uh, uh, the different primitives in the vectorized implementation. And they were actually able to vectorize everything in, in AVX 512 instructions. So they were getting the, the widest, the, 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 you know, using registers with the most lanes to do your SIMD evaluation. So you're getting it, the, 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 the amount of useful work you're doing per instruction or per cycle is, is, is in the maximal case here. So we were able to vectorize the hashing, the selection, and the projection. We weren't able to uh, automatically vectorize the hash table probing or the aggregation. Because again, these are random lookups into the hash table and it's, it's hard to vectorize that. So it wasn't able to do that. So the, for this graph here, what we're showing is the, the reduction in number of instructions we would execute uh, for, for running these different queries relative to a implementation that doesn't have any vectorization. So auto vectorization is turned off. It's no manual instrumenta instrumentation of the source code. It's just like the scalar implementation of each primitive. And so what you see is that for, with the exception for Q6 uh, in the manual implementation, you're getting quite a significant reduction in the number of instructions that you're going to actually execute, right? And in some case here for Q9, you're getting an 82% reduction in instructions. Uh, and so, yeah, so also too, this is the auto vectorization. This is manually written with intrinsics. And this is sort of a hybrid approach that tries to, you know, for the, some cases where the, 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 the compiler couldn't figure things out, we would use our, uh, they would use the intrinsic imp implementation. So again, for, across all the board, uh, especially in Q9, excuse me, you're getting a quite a reduction in, in the number of instructions. But now the problem is going to be when we actually run the queries, just because we reduce the number of instructions doesn't mean we're going to get uh, better performance. Again, so the, the reduction in performance here is relative to the scalar implementation. And so the reduction in time would be higher is better. So if I'm above uh, 0%, Anything above this, this, this sort of the middle line here means I'm getting better performance. So in the case of Q6 and Q3 for, and, and Q9, actually Q18 as well, for a bunch of these, you're actually getting worse performance. So in the case of auto vectorization with Q9, the Intel compiler generated code that ended up being 14% slower than what the, the non-scalar implementation actually was, right? And the reason is because you're, you're going to pay this penalty of Having more, because you have more complex, uh, you have more complex implementations, and you're trying to uh, you're you're trying to do a bunch more work inside every single loop. Uh, the cache misses are just going to are going to crush you, and so a sort of more simplistic uh, implementation of just iterating over one tuple at a time actually turns out to be uh, better than what Intel can generate for for their code. Um, Again, manually written code for, for vectorization is always going to be better in this case here uh, for these other queries. But for this reason, the, the ICC actually generates bad code for us, for, for, for databases. And I don't remember uh, what the paper said about Clang and uh, GCC. I think in those cases, it, it couldn't auto automatically vectorize it. So it, it'd be the equivalent to the, the, the scalar implementation. All right, so the... Next thing I want to talk about, though, is, again, as this paper sort of, um, 
this paper uh, made the big assumption, somewhat, in, until you get to the very end, um, they make this assumption that vectorization and, and compilation are mutually exclusive. So if I'm going to build a database system, I either go vectorize or go compilation, and I can't have the two together. There's a little blurb, though, at the end that says, oh, well, you could combine them together. Peloton, it's Carnegie Mellon's old database system, does actually do this, but they claim that the engineering overhead of trying to do this is actually quite significant. And so they have this graph here that shows sort of this, these different design decisions over the spectrum here in this quad chart about like, you know, whether you're doing two-part of time or vectorization or interpretation versus compilation. And hyper is over here because it's doing compilation, but it's two-part of time. Vectorwise is over here because they're doing vectorization, but it's all through interpretation. And then Peloton is sort of in the middle here. It's sort of true, yes, because you're, you're, we are doing compilation, um, and we do get some vectorization. Maybe not to the full extent that 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 vectorwise does, because they try to vectorize everything. Um, but it's just showing that you can actually do this. You can sort of combine the two of them together. All right, so let's look at what uh, sort of how Hyper views views uh, views pipelines. So again, they're doing operator fusion, which means that. Within a pipeline, they want to fuse together or combine together a, the bunch of the different operators we're going to have in that pipeline so that within one iteration of a for loop uh, in the pipeline, we're going to execute as many steps on that tuple uh, before we go back in, to the next tuple. All right, and the idea, again, that just means we're writing it up the query plan as far as possible. So this inherently means that the pipeline itself is a tuple at a time process because and for one tuple, we're going to have a bunch of operators that are fused together. We execute it and then go to the next tuple. So it looks like a really simple query here. We do a scan, a filter, followed by an aggregation, and then we emit the tuple as the output. So Hyper could generate code that essentially looks like this, where we're going to scan through the tuple A, and then we evaluate the, the, the predicate on the age, and then we update our counter for our aggregation. So the first pipeline is here, right? The first for loop is going to scan through every tuple in A, and then check do the, do the filter, and then update the aggregation as, as needed. The second pipeline is just to iterate now over all the tuples in our aggregation hash table or dictionary, and then produce that a, a, as our output. So what are some problems with, with this approach, right? If you want to try to vectorize it. Well, the first problem is that we're not able to look ahead in any, anything in our tuple stream, and then we're not able to overlap the computation uh, work we're doing with the memory access that we want to do. So again, here's our scan, filter, and aggregation steps. The, in the case of the filter, what's happening is that because we're looking at a single tuple in our for loop, we can't vectorize this, right? Because we have one tuple for each invocation of the for loop, and we go get a bunch of stuff. The next issue is that for the aggregation here, this is going to be a uh, you know a, a random lookup in our in our memory address and for this hash table to update the counter, and then when we're done, then we loop back and go get now in the next tuple. So there's actually two places we could have cache misses here, right? We could have one here when we do the probe and to update the hash table, and we could have another one when we come back around and go get the next tuple. So what we could potentially want to do is this may be unavoidable because we may, we don't know what this address is until we actually go and and do the lookup. But certainly we could potentially prefetch the next tuple in our in our vector that we're trying to process, so that we do all this work, uh, computational work here. And by the time we come back around, the next tuple that we're looking for is is available to us. So this is what the goal is. We're trying to do with relaxed operator fusion. We're trying to get the best of both worlds. We're trying to do vectorized processing as we did in vectorwise, but we're doing this in a system that is that is is using the query compilation in the push-based model that uh, that Hyper is, is doing. So the way this is going to work is that we are going to now uh, take a pipeline and actually decompose it into stages in the right locations that are going to allow us to build buffers of tuples or vectors of tuples uh, in our intermediate output. And then we can then uh, process that vector within the stage, potentially prefetch the next uh, vector we need for that stage uh, while we go ahead and processing the current one, right? 
So it's just like we're doing an operator fusion. We're going to combine together multiple operators within, within a stage. We're going to have pass data from one stage to the next through our CPU cache by having these, these, these buffers reside in our CPU caches. So we're not worrying about stalling out the memory. So our vectors aren't going to be too large that, that they have to go out the memory. And then the idea is that the stages will be our sort of natural boundaries of how we do vectorization and how, how we're going to do fusion. So we go back to our example before, right, of our two stages. This is the part we, we can actually vectorize because we know we had to vectorize the filters because we saw that in the, in the, in the Columbia paper, we saw this in the vectorize uh, from, the, from the, the evaluation paper from today. So this is what we want to vectorize. So now to make this work, we're going to introduce a, a stage buffer here that allows us to process the tuples in stage one in a vectorized manner. And then we're going to write out the, the, the tuples that we, we collect from the filter into the stage buffer so that then, uh, because we're processing multiple, multiple tuples at a time, and then we can take this buffer now and then invoke the next stage in our pipeline to do the aggregation. We could either do this in vectorized manner or unvectorized manner. In this case here, it would be unvectorized because it's it's it's, it's uh, you know doing a hash hash table lookup hash probe. So if we go back now to our our query code here, we see that the in the first stage we're doing uh, we're iterating over uh, table A in chunks of 10, 24 tuples, and then we're doing a SIMD comparison across that that vector but then we're writing it out into the stage buffer. And then in the next step is when we just iterate over the stage buffer produced in the previous stage to then update our aggregation. In this case here, this is a scalar impl implementation. And then the last, the last pipeline only has one stage. We're just iterating over, over the dictionary produced in the, or the aggregation table produced in the, the, the previous pipeline and emitting that as our output. So the magic that's gonna make this work uh, to avoid the cache misstalls that we saw in, in Vectorwise for for this you know for this stage here is that we're going to use software prefetching. So with software prefetching, the idea is that we in, in x86 we we can explicitly tell the CPU, hey, we're probably going to need this next chunk of memory. Go ahead and prefetch it for us. This is different than hardware prefetching. Hardware prefetching is where the hardware tries to recognize, oh, I see you doing a scan over some stride of memory. So maybe you access you know this chunk right now, and it's very likely you're going to access the next chunk, and, you know, because in, it infers that you're in some kind of loop. And so therefore, it's going to go ahead and, and prefetch that for you. This is where we're actually explicitly telling the CPU, "Hey, we want this this chunk of memory. Go ahead and, and prefetch it for us." Now this doesn't come for free. Um, the in x86, there's you know there's a limit of the number of prefetch instructions or, or, or prefetch uh, outstanding prefetch invocations you're allowed to have before it starts dropping them or ignoring them. And certainly you can do this incorrectly so that you start prefetching things you don't actually need or you prefetch them too soon or too late. So by the time you get around in your for loop to go actually process that next chunk of data, it's either was there and it got evicted or, or it hasn't arrived yet. So it's not this magic thing you just invoke. The, you sort of have to be mindful of the amount of work you're going to do before you go need the next data, and you have to make sure you actually time this correctly. But in, in a database system, we know what we're, you know, we know what the query is, you know what the query is trying to execute, you know what the data looks like, you know what the harbor looks like, so you can actually code gen, uh, you know, these the, the the prefetch sizes and the the timing just right on a you know a per query basis or per system basis. So. Uh, the idea is that the, the in our for loops, we'll go ahead and prefetch the, the 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 start of the next stage, so that when we come back, or so yeah, prefetch the 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 next chunk of data we're going to access within a stage, so that we do that work for our fused operators, write it to our output buffer for the for the, for the, the stage, and we come back around, and the data we're looking for is, is available for us. So there's different types of of, of software prefetching techniques you can use. Uh, we're, in the case of x86, we're just going to do group prefetching because that's the simplest, right? It's just saying, you know, here's the chunk of data, go fetch it, prefetch it for us. All right, so now let's go look at performance we can get in our system uh, when we just do the regular push-based approach implementation, like in Hyper, 
versus introducing the, the reflect operator fusion with the prefetching. So we're doing Q1, Q3, Q13, 14, and 19 on a 10 gigabyte database. So in Q1, you don't actually see that big of a difference because this query is just computationally heavy and I'm just trying to do as much work as I can within a, within a single for loop. So prefetching and the, the fusion stuff doesn't actually help you here. But in the case of Q3 where there's joins, this actually does help. And same for all these, these other ones here, right? So again, so this is just saying prefetch doesn't help. And this can here, here is, is an example where, where prefetching does help. I should be also clear too, uh, these here could be just taking advantage of, of, of SIMD and may not necessarily using prefetching. This is an example where you actually you are using SIMD with prefetching. So let's look now of across all the different things you can do uh, in, a, in a compilation based engine between SIMD, the ROF and the ROF with prefetching and where, you know, how, how these things can accumulate and get better performance. So again, this is running in Peloton, which is the old system. So in this column here, it's just saying, if you don't do any compilation, it's just the interpreted engine, how much, you know, what's the, the sort of the upper bound of how worse the system actually can be. So this is actually terrible, right? This is running in uh, 21,000 uh, milliseconds. So this is running in, 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 in 21 seconds, right? This is like stupidly slow for a 10 gigabyte, um, uh, 10 gigabyte database that, that's all in memory. And so when you go now with do LLM compilation, you can re reduce performance by 97% over the interpreted one. So this is not a, I mean, this, this result is real. It's, it actually did happen. Uh, but I would say that don't get the impression that this is indicative of if you take an interpreted engine and you go out of compilation, you'll get this performance benefit. This is like a crappy interpreted engine and then a really well-written compilation engine. In actuality, it's usually about, about a 50% reduction. But now, within the, the compilation engine, we can see as we add these new techniques together, how much, how much better you're getting. So for, for Q19, it's, this is just one query, when you add in the ROF with the SIMD, so the stage buffers and using vectorized execution for some stages, you can reduce performance by 65%. And then when now you add in the software prefetching, uh, this can reduce it further by 3.5%. So again, like this doesn't, 3.5% compared to getting 65% drop or 97% drop doesn't sound that significant, but at this low level of like, you know, such a short query execution time, you're again, you're shaving off milliseconds, you're shaving off cycles. There isn't that much more room of, of, of how to strip it down, the query execution down further and get, get better performance. Okay, so just to finish up uh, the, we saw that in the case of vectorwise and hyper, you know, the, the no one approach was significantly better than any other one. Um, and that there was the difference in performance you did see was attributable to, you know, whether it was doing net, the paying penalty for branch mispredictions, uh, cache misses, uh, uh, the number of instructions per cycle, right? it varies per query. Um, and so what I would say is that the, you know, these results show that either one is actually, is actually reasonable. Um, but with ROF, this is allows you to get the best of both worlds. You can get that push-based compilation approach that you saw in Hyper, and also the SIMD vectorization stuff that you saw with, with Vectorwise, and it blends the two of them nicely. And I disagree with their conjecture that they made in the paper, even though I was a co-author on it, that the implementing something like ROF is just would be too difficult for uh, to, to, to try to do. And certainly in the case of the, the paper that they were, that we wrote, like, yeah, sure. Maybe it was, it was too, maybe too hard to add, add that. But if you're building a new database system to use RF, it's not something you have to sort of have everyone be able to reason about and re-implement over and over again. Once you sort of have it implemented as part of the CoGen engine that you've built, uh, it sort of, it sort of takes care of itself. So in our new system that we're building, um, you know, currently temporarily named, named after the dog, uh, you know, we, we already, we, we support this now. All right. So, uh, again, this is, this has been awkward. This has been tough. Uh, hopefully everybody is safe and feeling healthy and taking care of everything. Um, for the class, again, we will, uh, have, uh, office hours, uh, today at one 30 over on zoom. 
And then, uh, but if you need to meet me further, just send me an email and we try to try to find a time to get together and then post any of your questions about the projects on, on Piazza. So next class on Wednesday, we'll discuss hash joins. Um, this will be a sort of two part lecture. We'll do hash joins on Wednesday and then the following week we'll do sort merge joins or how to do parallel sorting. So now we'll go a little bit further now and say, all right, well, how do you actually implement uh, sort of modern join algorithms using either the, the vectorized or the, the compilation approach? Okay. All right. Uh, hopefully everyone's taken care of and you have enough food and toilet paper and everything's fine. Okay. See you guys. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Hooked like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and ripped the top.